Welcome to The Double Stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week I have the return of producer John Cuny Birdie. He was on way back in episode 13 and episode 16, so if you haven't heard those, I highly recommend you go back and check them out. On this episode, we continue on our conversation to discuss what's happened in the last 10 years, primarily his amazing One Mic series, as well as his work with Joe Satriani and Paul Gilbert. So let's get right to it. Here's my conversation with John Cuny Birdie. It's been about 10 years since we last talked. I had you on two episodes very quickly, almost back to back, where we talked once and then there's a few more things you want to talk about, like producer tips and whatnot. So I had you back on very quickly and we talked again. And a lot has happened in the last 10 years. And my, my first place I'd like to start is the One Mic series, which I think is amazing. Um, can you explain just to the people listening the concept is it seems somewhat of a lost art to me to record that way. The concept really is to try to record an entire band around one stereo microphone. Um, you know, this technique was used in the beginning to record orchestras um, and featured singers and musicians uh, primarily for radio, even before recording became a thing. Um, they'd set up one microphone, and then the band or the performers would um, be placed around the microphone in a way to get a balance um, for the broadcast. And they only had one microphone. So, and it worked fairly well. I mean, there's some really nice recordings done from uh, the, the 30s that are very well balanced. And, um, you know, they were quite popular. Well, of course, once we got into multi-track recording, that ended. And uh, as more and more microphones and channels um, progressed, the need to balance uh, musicians around one microphone became less and less, obviously. Uh, obviously, there's problems with trying to do that. Um, and, and it was, you know, obviously it was why people decided to do multi-track recordings was to be able to have the control over the individual instruments and singers, uh, for post-production mixing. So, you know, you started with two tracks and then four tracks, eight tracks, 16, and then, and now it's kind of infinite. Um, there are some real advantages to the method because you have the musicians in a room forced to listen to each other and to balance themselves in a pleasing way that doesn't really happen in a multi-track setting. Anyone who's been to a recording studio um and has recorded with other musicians, typically you find them with headphones on. Oftentimes they, ha they have control over their own headphone mix, and everybody in a way is kind of in their own world. And the result of that type of recording um, is less intimate, typically, and the communication between the musicians becomes... Uh, restricted to some degree. If the uh, guitar player, for instance, has got his his microphone, his feed up really loud so he can hear exactly what he's playing, he may not even be paying attention to what somebody else in the band might be playing um, or the drummer. So the idea of getting an entire band around one microphone to balance themselves creates a conversation among the musicians and an intimacy that has in, in many ways been lost um, in the modern uh, way of recording records. So I've been making records since the um, late 70s and 
it's all been multi-track. And I am certainly, uh, you know, I certainly enjoy that, that process and, you know, endorse it, endorse it. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm in the studio currently making a multi-track recording. So the idea of trying to do, get a band to record all around one microphone is not, it started really as an experiment to see whether or not it could be even done. To take the old method of balancing a band um, around the mic and and see if I could do it with modern recording. It, it, I wasn't trying to make a vintage recording with putting up an old RCA ribbon mic and you know get an orchestra in there and try to do anything like that. That wasn't really my intention. Uh, classical music today is still largely recorded this way. You don't have a 75-piece orchestra with mics on everybody. I mean, some people do that, but typically that's not how it's done. In bluegrass and folk music, it's not unusual to see um, musicians around one microphone. In fact, you can see, I mean, currently today, like at the Grand Old Opry, you know, they'll have one microphone out there and a couple of bluegrass pickers and a singer, and they can balance themselves around that microphone perfectly fine. What I wanted to do was to see if I could get a rock band or, you know, a, I'd call an Americana band, uh, somebody who isn't going to play too loud, um, if I could get them around a stereo microphone and balance them. And so I was working with a band um, and uh, I said to him one day, I said, hey, I got this idea. If you don't mind spending a couple hours with me. I want to see if I can balance the entire band and the singer and everything around one microphone. And let me see if I can do that. So it was this kind of a goof. Um, I, I, I wasn't really, it was, it was an engineering experiment. So uh, I placed the singer in front of the, in front of the mic. Uh, I placed the guitar amplifiers out to the side. I put the drums in the, um, in the middle. And I had them play. And, of course, I went in the control room and I pushed up the two faders and I went, wow, that's not great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I went, so I went back out to the studio and I started adjusting their guitar amplifiers and I moved the singer around. Um, and I went back in and I pushed up the faders and went, wow, that's, that's starting to sound real. I mean, it's starting to sound like a like a multi-track recording. So then I went back out and I kept messing with um, the, the level of the guitar amplifiers. You know, the effects that they may use would have to be done there in real time. I, you know, if they have foot pedals, they were going to need to uh, use those for distortion because I can't have them play too loud because it, they would drown out the singer, right? Even though the singer may be close to the microphone, if those guitar amps get too loud, it's going to be a mess. So had to turn them down, use some distortion, use some reverb, use some delays, do whatever I had to do to get it to sound as close to a, you know, a, a multi-track recording as, as I possibly could. And I was really quite please with with the way this recording sounded and the band came in and they listened to it and they said wow this is really great man I, this might this sounds even actually better than our the, you know the recording we did last year of this song i mean this sounds really cool well i didn't think a whole lot of it um but i said well go back out there and re let's do it one more time and i and i have my iphone with me and i'm going to just take a movie um of you doing this so I can show it to my friends to prove that I can actually do it. Because obviously if you just play somebody an audio recording, um, they're not going to know that it was recorded around one mic. And if you make it too good, they'll probably just think you're lying to them, <laughs> you know, because it's not something that people do. It's not something that, um, you know, like, like me in the beginning would even think was even possible. So I kind of, you know, I needed some proof. I needed proof that I actually was doing this with one microphone. So I went out and I took a little video um, on my phone and I walked around the band while they performed the song. 
um, around the one microphone, and you know you could see that there weren't mics on the drums. You could see there weren't mics on the guitar amplifiers, and you can kind of see where everybody was was positioned. And you know that was the end of it. Um, so a couple of days later, I went back and I looked. I listened to the recording, and then I went and looked at the video, and I said, you know what? I'm going to sync up the video with the audio and make a little cool, you know, my very first one mic video, essentially. So I did that, and I posted it on, I think I posted it on Facebook and on YouTube, and I started getting all these responses like, wow, this is really cool, blah, blah, blah. You know, it sounds really great. How do you do that? You know, there was like a, immediately a really a positive response from the whole thing. So I thought to myself, wow, could is this actually a real a real thing? I mean, is this something I could actually um, develop? Well, now I'm into about 45 one mic videos <laughs> and recordings. So uh, I did develop it. <clears throat> and so that's the genesis of, of how it started. And I, and I will add that, you know, multi-track recording, particularly now uh, digitally, um, can be exhausting and tiresome and oftentimes quite boring. And I think that was partly why I did this, because I was really getting tired of sitting around, um, you know, waiting for them to get that take, you know, the guitar player to finally get that guitar solo. And, you know, the, the problem with multi-track recording is that everyone's, everybody knows that they can fix their part. I mean... You know, you don't necessarily have to bring your A game. Uh, you can always wait till next Thursday when you're going to redo your part. And I think it's kind of, it's a safety net that is is now there for people. So when a band gets together in a room to perform, that is just a consciousness that exists. That, well, you know, if I screw my part up, you know, I can fix it. Well, what if you took that away from them? What happens? So that was partly my motivation was to see what happens with musicians when you take away the safety net and they actually have to perform it in one full complete take. Now, of course, when bands go out and play live, that's essentially what they do. They get, they get one shot of playing that song, but then they can move on to another song. People's memory of you know, mistakes and stuff is pretty short. But if it's a recording, any mistake just keeps coming back to haunt you. <clears throat> a lot of bands say, oh, yeah, man, we were, we've recorded our record live in the studio and blah, blah, blah. You hear this all the time. But we all know that, you know, if somebody makes a mistake, they're probably going to fix it. I, there's, there's nobody out there... There's no bands or performers that go go into studios now and go, we're not going to multi-track. We're going to just record live to a two-track. Uh, you, you, nobody does that. So when somebody says, yeah, we recorded our band live, the first my first question is, well, did you record it live to a multi-track <laughs> so you could fix it? Or did you record it live to a two-track where you can't fix anything? So, you know, there's a bit, I don't want to say it's dishonesty, but there is this um, um, illusion that gets um, uh, created with live recordings. You know, every live recording that's made today, I would say in the last 40 years, they've all been messed with. Every one of them. Nobody, nobody goes to a big... No one goes to have their show recorded at a at a big concert, multi-track, and then just says, yeah, just mix it, we're good. I, I, it just never happens. You're never going to make a record like that. The producer, the engineer, members of the band are going to get together at a studio, 
They're going to sit around the console. They're going to listen to everybody's parts and they're going to go, wow, I'm going to need to fix that. I'm going to need to redo that. Let's cut this, you know, let's cut the the intro from Friday night and cut it and cut it to, you know, the the rest of the song that we did on Saturday night. I mean, there's going to be edits and manipulation. So getting back to, to my one mic project, I said, well, I'm not going to allow that to happen. There will be no editing of the audio or the video. These are these are my rules. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no edits. Uh, you have to re- you have to do it in one take, um, and you've got to do it. And you can do it as many times as you want. They can go in there and uh, perform the song 10, 15, 20 times if they have to. Hopefully they don't, but if they have to, they will until we get one full, complete take of of, of everyone's performance around the one microphone. Um, and then I have, um, I hire a guy to shoot the video. Uh, we use one camera. It's a one, it's, it's what I would call a one person perspective. It's like inviting somebody into the room to witness the exp- to to witness the recording. That's what I'm. That's what I give people when they sit down and watch these videos on YouTube. It's like come on into the studio and walk around the room and watch watch these performers perform this song in one full complete take. Um, I you know I understand. I I knew inherently that if I did a multi camera shoot that that would require editing and then people would go well if the video is edited then maybe the audio is edited too you know when they cut to the guitar is that really from what ta- you know so it needed to be one full complete take of, of the video and the audio together and i've never seen the audio and the video being ever separated. Some people say, well, can I just have the music? I don't need the videos. I I want high res versions of the video. I mean, of the audio. And um, I've been very reluctant to separate the two because the video really supports the audio and the audio obviously supports the video. So that's kind of the whole thing. And I've kind of gone on and on about it, but um, it's kind of, it's it's such a different approach that it kind of requires I don't know a, a ten minute. <laughs> no, that's great. No, that's what I, I love it. So um, that you know we can get into the more of the technical aspects to how I do it if you want, but I kind of really wanted to philosophically um, uh, lay out the 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 the, the ground. You know that the groundwork I did to get it to get me to the point where I am right now with it. Absolutely. And now you've been you've been making records for a long time, so you can probably that's, this is a little much, but you can almost do it on autopilot doing a traditional multi multi track record because you've made a ton of them. So changing up your process to do it this way, I have to imagine creatively gets the juices flowing in a way that you probably haven't felt in a while. Is that fair? Well, yes. Um, there's more pre-production. Um, the, you know, the choice of song is important. How well rehearsed the the act is, the band is, is essential. You know, I I make records all the time where the guys come in and they and they start playing, and I can clearly hear that. They haven't played this very much, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, the, the 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, bands would p- play live, you know, most of the time, four or five, six nights a week. They'd tour, they would tour, they would tour. Recording was just something they would do one day, you know. They, they would just go in and they would just basically record what they had been playing on stage. And then it got all flipped on its head where people go to studios now. You know, if you've got your own studio in your house, you can be self-indulgent. You can sit around, you know, for 
months, years, um, building a, a recording, building, uh, you know, a crea- you know, creating layer after layer after layer. It's a process. People do that. I'm not judging that. Um, it does produce a particular type of music and a and a particular feel, if you will. Uh, you know, I mean, it all got flip, flipped on its head. So I get together with a lot of people, and they don't. They just figure it's all going to come together in the studio. And I would say nine out of ten of them will tell me a year later, man, I wish we would have recorded that song after we had toured, <laughs> rather than before we actually played it, because we play it a whole lot better now. So there's a lot more pre-production with the one mic process, of course, because they have to get it in one take. And they know it. I mean, when I invite people to do it, I say, listen, you're going to have to record this in one. So they have to bring their A game. You know, they, they walk into the studio and they're a little nervous. They may not have done it this way before. Taking away the safety net, taking away their opportunity to come back on Thursday and redo that bass part or whatever, you take that away from them, the energy in the room is very, very, very different. There is, first of all, they're all looking at each other. They're all talking to each other. Um, They're discussing their parts and how they work with each other. It's not unusual for somebody to say, well, that part you're playing doesn't really work with the part I'm playing. Uh, let me uh, let me work something out, you know. Where in a multi-track recording, they might not say that. They, you know, one person might go, "Yeah, my part's not really working with his, but I'll figure it out tonight, and I'll come back tomorrow. And I'll just redo my part. Since I'm going to redo my part, let's not worry about it." Well, if you've got five people in the room saying. Well, if my part isn't really working very well, I'm going to come back and redo it. What the hell are you recording? What I mean, what is that? And and that has been you know, the mode of operation for multi-track recording since it started. So, I just said, I'm going to take all that away from you and let's see what you can really do. And I have to say of the 20, I don't know how many people I've done this with now. I'm in the 30s, maybe. Every one of them have shown up really well rehearsed, some better than others, of course, um, and have really brought their A game, and they actually enjoy the process. And the beauty of it is, is when we're all done and there's a playback session, you know, when, 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 all the rec- when all the recordings are done and they come back in and I play back what we've done, they are truly proud of what they've done. They go, wow, it not only does it sound great, but our playing is really, really good. They, I mean, they're hearing the final product. They're hearing the final mix right there on the spot. And they walk out of the studio going, wow, not only was that fun, but we really, you know, we've got really something to be proud of. You know, there's no producer back there. Oh, don't worry about it. I'm just going to add some more reverb to it. And there's no engineer there going, I'm just going to, you know, do this and do that and make some edits and do some EQ. And then it's all going to go to mastering, you know, and maybe in three weeks, Six weeks from now, when you finally hear the final result, then you're really going to dig it. Then it's really going to work. It's really going to sound good. But don't don't worry about the way it sounds right now. Uh, you know, it's a little rough, you know, and we're going to need... There's none of that. I've basically taken the engineer out of it, and I've taken the producer out of it. They are producing and balancing themselves, and they can take 100, 100% of the... Uh, you know, responsibility of it. Uh, Yes, of course, I'm there and I'm guiding the process, but ultimately it's in their hands. And it's a, I'm telling you, it's such a very, very different type of experience, studio experience that I've been used to. And it's quite rewarding. Now, 
Am I saying this is the way everyone should record? Of course not. I'm in the studio now doing multi-track recordings because those records sound a lot different than than my you know than the one mic process. Um, so it's you can't apply it to everybody. But if you have a band and you're and you want to and you want to demonstrate to people that you're the real deal that you can actually record and play around at, at simultaneously around one microphone in this case and pull it off uh, and then have a really beautiful video that demonstrates who you are and what you do it's a great little advertising feature it's it's another aspect of how maybe a band might want to present a particular piece of music it's going to sound different than the record and that's fine you know and it should you know like like this is just another version of this song you know MTV used to have that thing called unplugged it's it's a little bit like that you know it's like yeah, it's a great song, and we perform it and do it a little bit differently, but this is just a new and different way of, perf of performing it. So all the bands I work with, I say, hey, you know, at some point, if you guys want to do a one mic of this song or that song or that, we can do that. And oftentimes they say, yeah, uh, we can do that. And, you know, we make the videos and they use it for social media or whatever. So it goes hand in hand with conventional record making. It's it, I'm not I'm not suggesting... You know, it should re it, it, we go backwards and, or and and or start to try to replace multi-track recording. People are way too dug into that. I mean, it's just too much of a thing right now. So and and people don't rehearse enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they got to have a multi-track. So when you started doing the one mic, you said about how you had to play around with placements to get a good sound. Like it took a few, you had to play around with it to get there. Now you've done you said forty five of them. Is there a set template now in your head where, okay, I know where I'm going to put everybody or is every band, and especially with a different number of members, is every band so different that you have to kind of start from scratch every time? Um, I have to start from scratch um, every time because every band is different and every room you try to do this in is different and the rooms, the sound of those rooms have a lot to say in how you're going to place the instruments and the musicians, uh, the singers. Uh, you know, rooms that are really ambient are going to require a different, slightly different approach than rooms that are really dead, for instance. Um, to get a bit technical... I'm using a stereo ribbon microphone. Okay, so there's a couple of a couple of advantages to using a ribbon microphone for this application. One is uh, ribbon mics tend to not have a lot of high frequency um, extension, uh, not extension, but uh, bump. Early condenser microphone design was really used for classical recording on analog tape. So the, all of them have this rise starting anywhere around 4K up to around 10K. Every large capsule condenser microphone, if you look at the, the frequency plots on those, they all have a big bump, or they all have a bump somewhere up there. And it can create some unpredictable... Uh, results when you're trying to to record a bunch of instruments at the same time around the one microphone. The beauty of a ribbon microphone is that it's got a fairly flat high frequency response, and the and the low end extends down pretty pretty good too. So you have. Um, so it can take EQ. So once, you, once you've made your recording, it will almost always require a certain amount of equalization. But if you don't have these funny bumps, a high-frequency bumps, it's a lot easier to add the EQ to it. So again, because I'm trying to balance many instruments and singers around one microphone, I needed a microphone that was going to be essentially as flat as possible. Something that 
um, gives me closer to what I hear in the room than some sort of exaggerated, boosted, hyped up version of it, which would be fine if you're recording a string orchestra, particularly to analog tape. You know, if you look at a U47 or U67 or any of the Neumanns or AKGs, uh, Telefunken microphones, they all have that high frequency rise. Um, and, you know, they're beautiful sounding. They're beautiful sounding microphones. Um, but again, they were designed for analog tape, uh, you know, which would ultimately, particularly after a few generations and then going to vinyl, would push that top end back down. So it was kind of a compensation curve, if you will, that was employed. And they're still used today. I mean, that was one of the funny things about digital. When everyone started recording to digital and they were using these condenser microphones, they were all going, wow, that's harsh. That doesn't sound very good. It's too bright. I don't like digital. It's, it's too thin. It's, it's like, uh, no, the digital is flat. The problem is, is you're using microphones now that were basically designed for analog recording. And so you have to start using them differently. And it took, you know, it took 10, 20 years for people to, to figure that out. Yes, digital did not, digital itself, the converters themselves were not great in the beginning. So there was also that. But having microphones with way too much top end on them certainly exacerbated the problem. So I'm recording digital. Um, and so I'm aware of that top end frequency. And, you know, we have to make, you know, make those adjustments when we're using them. So the ribbon microphone I'm using, like all ribbon microphones, is active on both sides of the ribbon. It's a bi-directional microphone. That is, it, it picks up signal from the front of it and the equal amount on the back. And the frequency response of the front and the back are identical. You can take a condenser microphone, and many of them have polar patterns that you can switch. You can switch a condenser microphone uh, to bidirectional, which act, act, activates the front and the back of the capsule. But I can tell you from experience that the sound of those two capsules, or the one capsule that's charged on both sides, or however it's done, will be different. The front will sound different than the back. They always do. There's no exception to that. With a ribbon microphone, that doesn't exist. The front and the back are identical. Now you take a stereo ribbon and you do an XY configuration where they're basically, the, 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 um, the ribbons are crossed in the middle. So now you have a stereo field in front of the microphone that you can work with work within, you know, you have a left, right, and a center. And then on the back side of that stereo ribbon microphone, you have another stereo field. So, so the beauty of a stereo ribbon microphone is you have two stereo fields to work within, which for what I'm doing is a huge advantage because I don't have to try to set a band up around you know, one side of a microphone, which which would be really difficult physically because you're trying to cr uh, crowd all these people in there. You you got a set of drums there. You got a bass amp. You got two guitar amps. You got maybe some with acoustic guitar. It, you couldn't really do it very well. But if I have two sides um, to work in, then it gives me twice the amount of real estate to you know, maybe just have the drums on one side of the mic, <clears throat> their volume in the mix will, will be dependent on how close they are to that side of the microphone. So if I want to turn the drums down, I move them back. If I want to turn them up, I move the drums up. So then I can balance that. On the other side of the microphone, in that stereo field, I can have a guitar amplifier left, a guitar amplifier right, and I can have the singer stand in the middle. Yeah? So... That way, by moving people in and out and back and forth and deciding on what side of the microphone things are going to be positioned, I can get myself a really, really good balance, a 
Very, very good ballads. You asked me about a template. I've realized through experimentation and making a lot of these things that having guitar amplifiers on a stool, because the, the amps have to be up, 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 up near the level of where the cat, where the ribbons are. If they're down on the floor, uh, the the mic the the ribbon that's at the bottom of the stereo mic will pick it up more, and it won't be it and it it'll be it'll be to one side or the other. I'm I, I know I'm getting a little bit technical, but so anyway, I know that the the guitar amplifiers need to be put on stools. So I usually use combo amps, put them on stools, and get them up. I put them left and right. I put the drums in the middle. I often take like the bass amp, usually a large combo amp for bass. I put it in front of the bass drum and I have the drummer play and I have the bass player play and I adjust the bass player's uh, volume to, to get the marriage of the bass guitar and the kick drum and the drum kit together. Like I was mixing a record, you know? You have the, you have the drums all mixed and sounding great, and then you turn up the bass and try to get it to fit in there with the kick drum. I, that's basically what I do. I have them both play. I turn up the volume of the bass amp until there's a marriage of that bass guitar and the kick drum. So now I know I have that set. Then I go to the other side of the microphone, and I have guitar left, guitar right. They're usually about seven feet away at 45-degree angles to get me a really good, clear, hard left and hard right. Singers are always in the middle. If I have more than one singer, I might put them on both sides of the microphone. Um, and then the other instruments and other amps or whatever else is going on, I will just move them around these two, two stereo fields to get something that sounds like a multi-track recording. So there you, there you have it. I know, again, I'm being long-winded with this, but it's it's... It requires an explanation because it's it's just not like, oh, what microphone do you use to record Joe? Oh, I stick a fifty-seven in front of the mic. Next question, or in front of or in front of his amp. Next question. You know, it's it's yeah. it's not simple. It's it's actually quite difficult. Yeah, yeah. The idea that it's one mic makes it seem simple, but it's the exact opposite. It's infinitely more complicated. Yeah, infinitely because I'm trying to get a performance. And record, I mean, I'm doing everything at once. Everything is being done at once. And when I'm done, yeah, I apply mastering to it, um, which is could be a whole nother conversation. But, um, you know, I come home with stereo recordings. And like all stereo mixes, they, they're going to require some amount of mastering. So um, I apply, you know, your, you know, your typical mastering techniques, which would be EQ, compression, limiting. Uh, sometimes I'll add reverb uh, to the recording. If I feel it's too dry or I want the singer to have a little bit of depth, I have a process I use to to add a little reverb to that center channel. So, um, and that's it. Then I sync it to the videos and I'm done. Now, one of the interesting projects that came out of this was the Paul Gilbert record, Behold Electric Guitar, which started as a one mic. And then for some reason, which I'm, I hope you'll explain, you decided to, to abandon that and go to the more traditional multi-track recording route. So first, how did that opportunity come along? Like, did Paul Gilbert see one of these videos and call you up and say, I want to do a record with you? And then why did you uh, pivot away from it when you got into the recording? Um, yes, I believe Paul saw... Uh, some of my videos and he works at us. <clears throat> he was working at a time at a studio up in Portland called the Hallowed Halls. And the engineer there is an old protege assistant engineer of mine called Justin Phelps, who worked here in the Bay area with me for years and years and years, really an outstanding recording engineer. He moved to Portland and uh, built the studio, which is really fantastic. So he knew Paul. He had done some work with Paul. And when Paul said, hey, have you ever seen John's one mic videos? Uh, you know, I like this idea of, you know, recording live. Do you think, you think you can do that? And Justin said, 
I think, yeah, I think it can be done, but I don't want to do it. You got to call John. You got to have him do it. Because Justin understood how complicated and difficult it was going to be. I don't know. I don't think he just wanted to, to go try to do it himself. Um, and, it, you know, made it might have been out of disrespect. He might have just said, hey, you know, he, he's asked me to do this. I, I can I can try to do it, but I'd rather see you try to do it up here. <laughs> so I talk, I had a long talk with Paul, and what he wanted to do essentially was to do a live record. That's really what he wanted to do. He wanted to do a live record in the studio, and he thought that since the one mic recordings uh, sounded really good, that that would be a way to do it um, quickly and and cheaply. Right, he didn't want to get bogged down with overdubs like, like apparently he had done in his on, with his previous records. I mean, everyone goes through this. Everyone makes that record that takes forever, and then when it's done, they go, "Yeah, it's okay." You know, I, I don't know if it was worth all that time and effort. So, uh, and and Paul is such a a great live performer, and he's got such skill as a guitar player and he plays a lot of shows that I'm sure are quite rewarding for him as a player that I think he knew that he could probably if anybody record something live in a studio setting and not get bogged down but one way to not to be absolutely assured that you're not going to get bogged down is to do it with one mic because there's no opportunity to overdub anything, and there's no opportunity to remix anything. So I think there was a part of Paul that really was attracted to that idea. So I had a talk with Paul, and I said, listen, for an instrumental rock record, you know, the your fans, they're going to want it to sound a particular way. And I'm not 100% sure I can deliver that with this process. So I said, why don't we get together for one day and do an experiment and see if, let let, let me just see, we'll do a couple of songs and we'll see if this is going to work or not. I wasn't 100% sure I could pull it off. So I went went up to Portland And he came in with a band, um, a keyboard, bass, drummer. And I, I said, I, you know, we spent the day recording around the one microphone. And it was a lot of fun. And I got to meet Paul and spend some time with him and come to the realization that he's clearly one of the best guitar players I've ever been fortunate enough to be in a room with. I'm, and he's... And he's an absolutely charming human being. One of the nicest, funniest people I've ever met. Great sense of humor. We got along really, really well. So um, I went ahead and did the recordings. I came back and I listened to them. And I decided that I wasn't 100% sure that I was going to be able to pull this off as a multi-track recording. However, I was willing to pursue it. <clears throat> so I, I, and I told Paul, I said, you know, it's going to require the drummer to play a certain way and to have a certain size drum kit, and I'm going to have to put it in the room. My biggest concern was really the drums, because a, a, a guitar instrumental record, drums are really important. It, it can't be this guy playing drums in the background. It's really like a featured well, all the instruments are featured in, in a way, right? Where if you, have a, if you have somebody singing, all the focus is on the singing and the lyric, and that can take up a lot of the attention to a recording. And if there's drums and they're tight and they're, and they're played well and they're, in the back, and they're in the back of the mix, you can kind of get away with it. But I was really worried about doing a guitar instrumental record this way. <clears throat> So I think uh, it was about three or four months later, we started the record. We booked like, 
I think, five days to do it. He had a whole album. It was all written. He, he, has it, he had his musicians together. I went up there, and I basically set it up the way I did for the test recording. And I started recording, and I just things just did not go well. I did not like what I was getting. Uh, one of the drummers we were using was not really cooperative with the process. Uh, wasn't particularly his fault. He was just used to multi-track recording, and he uh, it just did. It was just not working, uh, and I felt really bad because we had the studio booked, and I was pulling the plug on doing this with one microphone. So I went to Justin. I said, Justin, I don't know, man. I'm not. I really want to do this multi multi-track. And he goes, well, you're going to have to go talk to Paul about that. <laughs> so I went to Paul, and I said, listen, I want to record a live record with you. And I, and I will, you know, insist that there will be no overdubs if that helps, but I need to record this multi-track to get it to sound the way I think ultimately you're going to want and, and ultimately how your fans are going to want it. And he said, he looked at me, he says, okay, that was it. <laughs> he says, okay, yeah, whatever you want to do. And, and I was just like so relieved. And I went back into the control room and I said to Justin, Justin, go get the mics. <laughs> Let's put mics on everything. <clears throat> and so, you know, within a couple of hours, we had everything mic'd up and we were rolling and we did know over, to, I think there might've been one or two songs we added a keyboard or some a keyboard part, but Paul did no overdubs. That record is truly live in the studio, and you know we did five or six takes of each song and picked one. There might have been a couple of songs where we might have made edits, where we took the first half of one take and connected it to the second half of another take, but Paul did not do any overdubs. We might have repaired the bass a few times, but the drummers that we used, we, I think we used three different drummers on this thing. They were all fantastic performers. Everyone was brought their A game. Everybody knew we were recording live. And I'm really proud of that record. I, I was, it's just a marvelous experience to record musicians at that level in a controlled studio environment and do it live. Um, for an engineer, there's really nothing better. Because you know, the fun part of engineering is hearing, is experiencing the performances when they're all, when it's all happening. That's just a wonderful feeling. Um, what's not a wonderful feeling is like spending three days and go, okay, I think we got the drum tracks. Uh, let's start, we'll, uh, you know, on Friday and Saturday, we'll do the bass. And then we'll start doing the guitar overdubs, you know, next Monday. I mean, I, I, I don't even record that way anymore. I just kind of refuse. Uh, I'll produce a record like that and just hire an assistant engineer to do all that. I just, I have no patience for that anymore. I'd rather go make one mic recordings where everybody's got to have their shit together. I don't, the, the, the long self-indulgent overdub sessions, people can do that at home now. I'm just not into it. I, I'm too old to do it. I don't want to do it anymore. I did it. I did it for 40 years. I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> so Paul gave me a gift that was um, a, a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And like I say, he's just like the greatest guy ever. And what an insanely good guitar player. Uh, he'd go out there and play those songs top to bottom and to me, to my ears, they sounded like identical performances. He was only doing it so the band could, could get it better, right? You know, we'd do a take and he'd go, well, that was okay, let's do it again. But what he was really saying was like, hey, the drums aren't together quite. The bass and, you know, the keyboard part aren't working. Why don't you guys work that out? But his part was virtually identical, note for note of the previous take. Just consistency, um, 
energy, uh, timing, um, uh, intonation, just insanely good and always fun. I mean, he just always was having fun. He had fun the entire time. It was really a very, very a bit of an unusual experience, um, but really exciting. It kind of brought me back to the early days of me recording punk bands where they would just come in and set up and play and you better be recording it. And you'd go, holy crap, what was that? You know, wow, it's done. <laughs> you know, that's it. That's it. That's the recording. That's it. You know, and, we, and I, you know, we soon got out of that. And mixing that record, having it been live and all essentially single takes. So that must have been a bit of a, a dream for you as well then. Yeah, I mixed that record in f- maybe four days. Yeah. You know, two or three songs a day, no problem. You know, when, when we would change drum drummers, we, you know, it, it would alter the sound. So it's, I would sometimes have to do, you know, some rebalancing. Um, but no, it, it was so consistent that uh, it didn't require a lot of, uh, jumping through a lot of hoops or a lot of production, uh, to get the mixing done. I wanted to keep it, you know, live and raw. I didn't want to start adding things to the production in post, uh, that I thought was groovy or cool or anything like that. It, it was basically they pushed the faders up and let it go, you know. Now, last time we talked, I think it was right before you would have done the box set for the Joe Satriani of remastering, I think, all the records and then do, finding a bunch of rarities. Um, can you walk me through that process a little bit? Like first, you know, getting the masters, was that hard? Or did you go to the masters or were you basically remastering off you know, the final original master, or did you go right back to the originals and then digging around and trying to find some rarities to include in that box set? Um, let me think about that. Um, two thirds of Joe's multi-tracks were analog. Um, starting in around 2000, he went digital. For, for multi-track recording. So the first order of business was to transfer all the two-inch multi-tracks to digital. Um, so that was something that we wanted to do as um, to archive his multi-tracks. In the process of doing that, we also archived all the two-track mixes, which is what we were going to need to do the box set. Particularly, if you're going to remaster, you want to go back to the original two-track mixes. So we did sessions where all these transfers were made. So I found all the analog two-track uh, tapes, transfer them to digital. The digital recordings, two-track mixes, we try to go back, and I think, I think I got them all. I got all the two-channel, two-track mixes that that were digital, uh, from that were in the archives. And some of them were much more difficult to ascertain and to uh, sort out because, the, again, the problem with digital is that you end up with so many versions of stuff because you have an endless uh, supply of hard drive space. So to go back and find, you know, mix eight uh, of a certain song that was, that was considered the master uh, t- took took a bit of uh, work on my part, forensic work, if you will, to 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 go back because I, you know, obviously I didn't mix all these records. We had the, a lot of the well, the early stuff we have um, stuff Andy Johns did, Glenn Johns, Mike Fraser, 
Um, so I had analog two tracks with with their notes I had to deal with. My stuff, all of all of my mixes were um, were fairly straightforward because I know what kind of notes I write on the back of these boxes. I, I know what an M, a red M with a circle around it means. <laughs> that means that's at the master. And, and a lot of times when you, uh, when you're mixing, you would take the, the final masters and you would take them off those reels and you would assemble them onto a huge reel, a big 12 inch reels with other mixes from other reels to cut vinyl. So we, we, I'd have to go find those larger reels that actually had the master tapes on them. So there was quite a bit of work to, to, to find all the two track stuff. The digital stuff was much more difficult. You would think it would be easier, but it's not. It's actually more difficult. Um, so I had to find digital uh, mixes from uh, Mike, um, and he'd have to supply. He'd have to look for them. Sometimes they were on DATs. Yeah, I mean, it was. It took some time and some effort. The uh, you mentioned the. The outtakes stuff, I think there's a there's a disc in there. I can't remember what it's called, the rarity stuff, or not the rarity. What's it called? Yeah, I think it's the a, a disc of rarities. Yeah, for sure that was included. Yeah, that stuff, Joe, I think Joe knew what was there and what wasn't there. He had, he had already sort of um, organized that part in his mind. So he just gave me a list of stuff I should go try to find. So, you know, those versions of, um, that he did with Glenn Johns and, you know, we had a b bunch of engineers, uh, man, uh, Eric Valentine, me, uh, Glenn Johns, all working on these songs with funny different titles. So it took a while for, for me to find that stuff, but eventually I was able to, to assemble it all in one place. It was all digitized, and then I got to work on it. The process of remastering it um, with all these different people and different techniques of recording, was it like a challenge to kind of keep it consistent and go throughout it all to make this one box set? Or you're not even trying for consistency, you're trying to honor the other work of the other people? Well, I definitely want to honor their work um, and not you know, alter it in any kind of way that would be, you know, inappropriate. I I think what was important was keeping the the loudness, if you will, consistent from track to track. So if you go from one C D to another, one isn't a whole lot louder than the other. You know, one of the issues was that the early stuff was not subjected to what we later called the loudness war, where everything was made, uh, was, you know, there was a lot of limiting applied compression to get the, to get the CD to sound as loud as, you know, the flavor, the flavor of the month band that was blowing up that had a big loud CD. And so we didn't have those I, I didn't have to worry about that anymore because those days are kind of over. So some of the earlier CDs, I mean, if you listen to it, the first generation CD of like Surfing with the Alien, and then you listen to like like Bernie Grumman's first version mastering of that, if you can find that CD, um, it's nowhere near as loud as George Marino's version of it that we did like five or six years later. Um, and then I remastered it, and at one point, I might have even made it louder than that. So what I wanted to do was to come up with a, a loudness level for every song on every CD to try to get building consistencies with that. And I was not subjected to the loudness war, so I could do this at levels that 
complemented the the material, um, and and it didn't apply. It didn't change the sound of the original mixes, but we're still, you know, we're still we're still loud and punchy and 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 fun to listen to. I don't know if that's a great explanation of 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 it, but. Um, there were, I want the only consistency I was concerned about was volume. I wasn't really cons- I wasn't really trying to get the low end to be the same on on every record. You just couldn't do that. And I and I had no control over the level of of course, you know, Joe's guitar or anything like that. So it was mostly you know, building inconsistencies and and staying true to the originals. I always listen to the original masterings to make sure I didn't get too far away um, sonically. I mean, some of them I thought were like really bright. I thought, wow, this is, these are, these are pretty bright. Um, And so in those cases, maybe I didn't go quite that far because when I listened to the tape, I'd go, yeah, whoever, you know, George or Bernie, they decided to make this brighter than I want to do it right now. So in some of those cases, I might have not gone quite as far. Um, you know, the technology we have now for mastering is 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 greatly advanced over, you know, what they had to work with in, in the 80s and 90s. As far as uh, the EQs are better, uh, compressors, the limiters, everything is better now. And it's all recallable because I'm, I stay in the box now. It's all plugins. I don't, I didn't use any upward gear at all. Now let's move on to shockwave supernova, which is, you know, a really great Joe album that you were deeply involved in Uh, trying to read the tea leaves and how he makes his choices. But do you think there was a reason why, okay, for that group of songs, I want John and that he comes to you like, Versus other albums where you're less involved, but that one you seem to be deeply involved. Yeah, I mean, I co-produced it and engineered it. So yeah, and mastered. And it was yes, and you know, it's funny when I after I got done with the mixes, I had every intention on handing it off to a. I actually, I did. We did. We handed it off to a different mastering engineer, because my philosophy has always been, if you mix it, you should master it. You're too close to it. You need. You need another set of ears on this thing. And I was kind of burnt out. So I said, well, I'm going to send it to so-and-so. And then we, and then, you know, the mastering came back and Joe said, what the hell is this? And I said, well, you know, I sent it to so-and-so and it's costing us a lot of money. I hope you like it. And he goes, well, I don't like it. He says, why aren't you mastering it? <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up doing the whole thing. But to, to get back to your question I don't know I, it's probably a better question for Joe why he picked me for this record I think that he he did detour um and as he should and and you know created a a body of work using other people uh, at, to, to engineer and to brute and to produce with, and I think that you know for some reason he felt that this for Shockwave Supernova because it was a bit of a a return to a songwriting style and production that I would just be better suited for it that that my. Um, sensibilities and maybe the way he and I work together suited this particular project. Um, he trusted me to guide him through the process as I always have. And he just, I don't know. It was, it was, a you know, a return to a return to some, a place that I think he wanted to go. He had gone Way out with with a maybe I don't know how many records, three or four records, I've lost count. Um, with other individuals, and maybe he didn't. 
you know, wanted he he did, you know he always wants to do something different anyway. So even if he had done this record with somebody else, it would have been different. But I don't know. There was something that he was looking for that maybe he didn't think he could get with anybody but me. I don't know. Uh, he wanted to record it here in town. Maybe he had his reasons for that. So, yeah, I was honored when he called me and asked me if I wanted to do it. I was, I was thrilled. And then when I heard the material, I went, oh, my God, is it just me or is this some of the best stuff he's ever done? I mean, I was really taken aback by the, the quality of the songwriting. So, yeah, I was thrilled to do it. Now, did any of your one mic philosophies, I like to record it live now, did, did any of that apply into that record? N- not really. Um, I mean, Joe understands the um, importance to get a really great drum performance in a live setting. In other words, him playing live, the bass playing live. If we have a keyboard player involved, get him out there, get everybody out in the room playing together. That's been the that's been the methodology of making his records for quite some time. Once he was able to afford musicians of, of, of quality, <laughs> um, getting everybody out there and recording uh, the tracks live was essential. So in that sense, yeah, we, we basically recorded live. Um, did we keep any of the guitar parts that he was playing live with the drums? Probably not, maybe 10% of them. Did we fix the bass parts? Uh, re- repair or out and out replace some of them, possibly. Uh, keyboard parts probably were all redone. So, but he wanted a complete take of drums. Um, so that was really the, that's the methodology for making Joe records. I, I imagine that's how he still does it. Gets everybody out there. He plays along with the band. Everyone's rocking. And then, we get if we can keep it all, we keep it all, which is rarely the case. Um, what we're really looking for is a spirited performance from drums from the rhythm section, the drums and the bass primarily. You've been very generous with your time. I just have one s- small question before I let you go. Joe's, um, a, I think, in rehearsals right now to start doing a, a show where he's going to play a bunch of Eddie Van Halen material. What's your thoughts on on Joe playing Eddie? Um, I was never, you, people are going to hate this, but I was never a big Van Halen fan. Uh, okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> How could that possibly be? And I'll tell you why. Because when that happened, I was in the studio with Joe. I was making Satriani records. I was, that was more than enough guitar for me to indulge in. My focus on a guitar player was was fully focused on Joe Satriani, not Eddie Van Halen, and I think that that it's always just sort of been that case, you know. I just never. I mean, I like their. I mean, listen. When I first heard them, I thought they were great, and obviously Eddie's a, a brilliant guitar player, but I never really got into the. I never cared much for David Lee Roth at all. Um, you know, I mean, it was kind of quirky and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, it's just it just wasn't something I was all that into. So I don't know if Joe wants to go do that. I'm I'm down with anything he wants to do. I know that it's not been easy for him to um, figure out how to do it because he has to honor his own interpretation, but at the same time, um, please the, the fans. And it's going to be a very, very, um, you know, he's going to be walking down that the edge of that sword every night because he can't please both of those things at the same time. He can't please himself with what um, he feels he needs to bring as an interpretation 
and please the audience at the same time. So I do have faith in his abilities as a guitar player, clearly. Um, so if people can go there with an open mind and, and allow Joe to um, channel Eddie in some way and understand that they're both great guitar players um, and what they're going to hear is some really amazing music and they can just relax and have fun. Great. But if you go in there going, well, he better sound like Eddie, I wouldn't even buy a ticket. If you have, if, if that's your point of view, don't go, I would say. So, um, but I think, I think anybody who just goes and relaxes and, um, uh, you know, this is not going to be a Van Halen tribute band, right? It's just not going to be that. So, there you go. That's my point of view on that. <clears throat> okay. I am, by the way, um, I'm currently, right now in front of me, I have the G3 reunion tour I'm, ma I'm mastering for everyone. Um, I'm about two-thirds of the way done. And that's uh, going to be uh, for streaming, for vinyl, and for CD. So you're going to have... Uh, Joe's set, Steve, Steve Vai's set, Eric Johnson's set, and then the jam set. It's going to be a four-disc offering um, at, at some point. So I'm, I'm handling all the mastering for that. Amazing. Any other projects you'd like to discuss before I let you go? Um, well, I'm continuing to do the one mic stuff. Um, I... I'm pushing the sort of the limits to, to what is possible. I want to try to do some things that are going to be even more difficult, maybe in different rooms with different types of acts. So that's kind of an ongoing thing that I do. Um, but other than that and uh, Joe's stuff is, you know, taking up a lot of time. I've done... You know, we did we did some Atmos mixing for we did surfing with the alien and Atmos. That took up a tremendous amount of time. Uh, there's a there's a lot of other sort of Joe related projects I'm involved in too. So yeah, I got my plates full right now. Okay, that was John Cuny Birdie. I hope you enjoyed it. That's it for this episode. I'll be back soon with another one. Until then, I'm Brian Sword. Thanks for listening. <laughs>